go. Oops. And here's the screen. That looked like a road trip that needed to happen. <laughs> it's unfortunately not my road trip. It's just the, <laughs> the picture that came with the computer. <laughs> um, welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much for spending time. I know that we're all spending way too much time in Zoom meetings. So we'll try to keep this to our 30 minutes, but we do have a lot to cover. Um, I wanted to see if anyone was up for practicing a little bit on some of the skills that you've been honing for the last couple of weeks, uh, just feeling confident, kind of talking to media, introducing yourself and what you do and your role. Um, and maybe we could practice a few kind of possible questions that reporters might be asking you. Should we give that a try? Does anybody with a state that starts with the letter A, a through H want to volunteer yourself to uh, kick us off and basically pretend that I'm the reporter and you introduce yourself and what you do and, and answer my question, which is, should residents of long-term care and nursing homes be able to have visitors now that our state is reopening businesses? Do we have anybody on the call whose state starts with A through H? Is that a no on the state or do people not want to practice their <laughs> time out? Yeah. No, I'm a Texan. Tea. Oh, you are. Okay. Okay. Uh, would you like to take that question then, Patty? I'll try. <laughs> You're going to ask me questions, right? I was just going to, yeah. Um, are you guys seeing my screen, by the way? Yes. Okay. Um, why don't we, since you're T, we'll ask, I'm going to say hi. Um, tell me, tell me who you are, Patty. And um, I guess my question today is, we're hearing some troubling reports that some residents of long-term care homes are not receiving their federal stimulus checks or that they're being um, taken by facilities. What can you tell me about this? Hi, I'm Patty Ducaye. I'm the Texas State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. And the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program advocates for nursing home and assisted living residents and we serve as their advocate and take the lead from residents um, and we have heard from some residents who are telling us they haven't seen their stimulus checks yet and have questions about whether they will affect their Medicaid eligibility in the future. Great, thanks Patty. Yeah, and just remembering that no matter what question you're asked is always a good opportunity to kind of, you know, what is the thing that use that media as your channel? Like what's concerning you right now? What do you want to make sure, um, you know, families and residents hear? And if, if there's any kind of call to action that you want to make uh, for homes or policymakers, make sure to try to squeeze that in. But that was great. Thank you. How about states that start with I or through P, the letters I through P? Is there anybody on from Iowa, Indiana, uh, Pennsylvania? <laughs> no? Come on, Susan, unmute yourself. All right, here we go. So I'm Susan Buxton. I'm the long-term care ombudsman for the state of New Hampshire. We advocate for residents' rights and we're always trying to improve the quality of life and quality of care for residents. Um, we are hearing that there's likely to be a second wave of coronavirus in the fall. And I think that um, as our Department of Public Health and our providers are partnering to make sure that they are doing adequate testing of staff and residents so that they're able to identify anybody um, that may contract the virus. Um, we hope there's been lots of lessons learned um, and that we are, we have a good stockpile of PPE um, to prepare for that, that possibility. We hope that it doesn't happen, but we really hope that people are better prepared. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. Anyone else will take one more practice question before we dive in.
Anybody want to answer the question of should long-term care and nursing homes be able to have visitors now that states are opening up their economies? People are going to get their hair done. People are going to restaurants. What's, what's your stand on, on whether homes should have visitation open back up? Come on, Sally, you're not an A through H, but you can answer this one. <laughs> Sorry, Carol, I just joined because I was doing something else. So if you can repeat the question, I'll give it a try. Okay, great, thank you. Um, do you think residents of long-term care and nursing homes should be able to have visitors now that, uh, that our state is, is reopening? And you'd like me to respond as I'm speaking with a media reporter? Yeah. Well, so I would start out by saying how very critically important visits are for nursing home residents and that they have the right to accept visitors at any time and that we want to work with our state in a thoughtful manner so that visits can happen um, while we work to contain the spread of the virus or the potential spread. And if that occur, occurs through either window visits or in outdoor visits where physical distancing is appropriate, that would be the goal that our program would see for resident visitors at this time. Thank you so much. That was great. That was great. Talking about the balance of needing to protect and, but yet the, the right of residents for visitors. Thanks guys, so I hope that wasn't too painful. Um, of course, we can always do this one-on-one -on -one if anybody wants some more practicing. Okay, let's uh, turn the corner here and, oops, too fast. Um, so the last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about kind of how to be responsive when reporters call. How do you respond to reporters? How do you stay on your message? How do you, you know, successfully navigate an interview? Um, but the truth is that most of the time, in order to really leverage media uh, as a tool for your program, you're gonna need to be get more proactive. You're not gonna wanna just sit there and wait for that call to come in. You're gonna want to really proactively reach out. Um, the good news is it's just, it's not, it's not super, uh, it's not rocket science. You, if you have a phone and a computer, you're ready to do it. You're ready to reach out and be proactive and contact reporters. Um, during the, the COVID outbreak, of course, reporters have been you know, extremely interested in your perspective, but that is going to start to fade and already has sort of taken a second seat um, to some uh, other events in the news, as we're all aware. Um, so picking up the phone and calling and emailing reporters and editors, number one, do you have a good list to, to uh, know who to contact in your state? Um, this is kind of blurry, but and it's just a basic list. It's an Excel spreadsheet of reporters' names and the outlet they work for, um, their email contact information, their phone number, what town they're in, uh, a good website to, to review what their coverage looks like, what beat they are, and whether they're a, a news reporter or an editorial page editor. Um, and also, you know, keep a column open for keeping track of notes or stories that they've done that are relevant to your work. And you can obviously keep this list any way you want, you know, Excel, Google Sheets, you can just do a table, a Word document, handwriting, it doesn't matter. But the biggest thing to keep in mind is make sure it's updatable. You're going to see that media changes frequently, um, you know, reporters leave or change beats. Um, so making updates and keeping it really relevant and accurate is going to help make your job easier. We'll quickly review uh, different types of media. So you've probably all heard about wire services. You've Associated Press is probably the best known and biggest um, syndicated news service in the United States. Um, and, a, and a wire service, a news service like this, they write copy that can be picked up and, and published in, in other um, media um, and other papers. Uh, and even and serve as a, sh a story for TV and radio as well. One that's I've come to mind that actually does do a lot of coverage on our issues is Kaiser Health News, which is a it's a nonprofit news service um, funded by the Kaiser Foundation, but also does great articles on our issues. And those articles can end up appearing in your state daily newspaper or even the New York Times. So it's a good one to keep in mind. Um, of course, daily newspapers. Uh, and the sad, sad truth here is that those are disappearing fast. Um, hopefully most major cities where you are still have at least one daily newspaper. 
Um, but medium and small sized towns are, you know, newspapers are barely surviving or they're gone. Um, and it's good to look in these markets for what, what is there? Are there weekly papers, community papers, local, online, kind of web-based news? Um, also, don't forget about kind of what we call the trades or specialty industry publications. For example, AARP has one. Um, those are really good to keep in mind. Uh, social media is a whole other thing. We're not going to have time to cover that today, and maybe we can in the future. But um, those are channels that that you know we can use that are that we're controlling more. So that's a that's a different ball game. Um, TV and radio, again, a special niche. It's good to keep in mind that they operate a little differently and are looking for something a little different than traditional print um, reporting. When you're pitching especially TV stories, you've got to really be thinking visually. Is this a visually compelling story? You know, think about when you watch your local uh, TV news and why do you see so many car crashes and fires and, you know, kidnappings and people being rescued from the river, it's because they got the photos, right? It's not necessarily because that's the most important story that day, but if it's visually compelling, TV is going to want to cover it. Um, also, when you're, when you're thinking about doing a TV or a radio interview or pitching a story to them, think about who you're talking to. Is this a news story? Is it, you know, if it is, you're probably looking at, at best sort of 30 seconds to um, possibly a couple minute long story. But if, if it's a long uh, format, you know, radio talk show that goes on for, you know, half an hour, that's a very different format and you're going to want to know more. Are you the only person being interviewed? Are you one of many guests? Does the show get callers? These are just good things to think about before diving in on, on TV and radio. Um, I, up here I mentioned, you know, it's good to have a, an image bank sort of of photos and, and pictures and videos that you might be willing to share, say, especially now with reporters not being able to go into, for instance, a, a facility because of social distancing, they might rely on you for um, photos or video footage that you've got and that is, um, has got all the legal sign off to be used um, in the media. So. And even if you don't use it with media, there, that's useful to have for your own website and, and posts. Okay, now you're getting ready to uh, make your calls. It can be intimidating to call a reporter, but it's, you know, just keep that relationship in mind. You're cultivating a relationship. They need you as much as you need them. Um, practice your pitch maybe with somebody from home or a friend or a colleague before making your first call. And the more you do of this, the easier it's going to get. It's, it's really, um, you know, like riding a bike once you get used to it. Here's some tips just keeping in mind that reporters are busy. And I think that's one of the things that makes it a little intimidating to call them. Sometimes they can be really brusque or in a rush or say they're on a deadline. They might even hang up on you. Um, you know, don't take it personally if a reporter is short with you or not interested. Um, just, you know, it's okay to say, to let them say no, they're not interested in, and come back to them at another time with another story. Respecting their deadlines. Uh, reporters' days usually get more and more hectic as the day goes on. So I find the best time to call them is really earlier in the day, um, especially if you've got something, you know, breaking news that's gonna be something they're gonna wanna write about and have published the next day or possibly even get that story on the news that night. The earlier in the day, the better. When uh, you're getting ready to, to call and, and pitch your story or yourself as somebody who should be interviewed, think about putting it in a, in a framework, a news hook. You've probably heard that term, news hook. And keeping in mind the root of the word news is new. Um, you know, whenever, whenever you're th you know, thinking about going to the media, what is it that's new? What's bigger, better, faster? Um, here's sort of a baker's dozen list of various news frames and hooks that might be useful. Um, responding to current of events in the news. You know, there's a story that's unfolding. We're in one right now. It's still continuing with the coronavirus. What's your reaction to the newest uh, development there? Localizing that national story. So there's a national, or is it actually a global pandemic? What's our local angle here in, you know, Rhode Island? How do we localize that? Keeping things like um, trends in mind, re reporters, especially national ones, to get them to cover what's going on in your state, 
they're going to want to see it at three makes a trend. So if something's happening in three states or it's happening in three towns or three facilities or it happened three times in one facility, that is what that kind of meets that that um, mark of a trend for a reporter. And, and they're going to um, be have an easier time, you know, getting that to be a story. Celebrity involvement kind of is obvious. Um, uplifting features around staff or volunteers, you know, human interest stories, dramatic human interest stories. You've probably seen these unfolding on the news, you know, where a husband and a wife have been separated for months and months, and now we've got a picture of them coming back together. You know, that's a natural. Um, controversy always sells. Uh, you know, he said, she said, you know, families say they're being not allowed to visit their loved ones. Nursing homes are saying they are allowing it. You know, that's controversial that a reporter is going to be interested in hearing both sides and, and hopefully in coming down to what is the truth of the matter. Calendar, you know, Mother's Day. I, I noticed, um, I think on your email, Katie, today, it said it's um, Elder Abuse Awareness Day. So if you had that in mind and you were you knew that was coming up next month or next week, that could be a good hook to pitch your story around. Um, milestones, you know, sad one happened a couple of weeks ago when our country passed 100,000 deaths. Special events. Uh, just out here recently, a, a long-term care facility hosted a kind of a drive-by um, high school graduation. So that was that got on the news. So how do we get the word out? How do we um, put ourselves on the radar screen of the media? A news advisory is really kind of almost like, think of it as a save the date. You know, this is gonna be happening in the next few days. Um, you know, get it out there to the assignment desk so they can put it in their, you know, morning daily scheduling of where reporters are going, where to send video crews. It's the who, what, where, when, but it's don't, you don't need to provide uh, more than that. You don't want them to be able to get the whole story just by reading this advisory. You, this is really a, hey, come and hear us out, whether that's in person, literally at a site or on the phone in like a press conference over the phone or a press availability over the phone. This was a real advisory we did in March um, where we wanted to let reporters know that Patricia was gonna be out there at Life Care Center of Kirkland responding. Uh, because reporters were all gathered there in one place, um, which is unusual, you know, again, we're not going to often have that kind of opportunity. What's a press release is, is a little bit, it's more, it's really your whole story in one page. Try to make it, you know, succinct and to the point um, and have that news hook right up front. But it's going to contain everything the reporter needs to do their story. It's going to have the who, what, where, when, plus why, how, you know, quotes from from key people context data points and and what is the call to action there um, and of course your contact information clear so that they can call for additional questions but this press release should have everything where if they even if they couldn't get in touch with you for an interview they could still write the story um, a statement again another tool in your toolbox a statement is useful, I feel like, when you can't be there in person. Say there is a news conference in the state capitol with a various authorities on your issue and you can't be there, but you want to make sure that media, policymakers, others have, have, have your perspective. A statement is every word for word what you would have said or what you did say. Um, it's your remarks, basically. So anything on this statement could be quoted by a reporter in their story. Okay, what's the difference between a press conference and say a press availability or briefing? A press conference, think about major announcements. You know, usually these are held by uh, I don't know, elected officials or uh, business leaders on something major and new where all reporters are gonna wanna, or they're gonna have to cover that um, and they're gonna wanna, the, the, the person speaking, is not going to be able to do individual interviews with everybody who's going to want to cover that story. They have to show up and at one time um, communicate their announcement. So again, that's going to be rare for us to need that tool. A press availability is probably more useful where, um, again, either on site or by conference call, 
you are going to be able to reach reporters and not have to do a bunch of individual interviews, but make it easy for all media to participate at the same time and have your voice be heard um, at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and say though, a lot of reporters are not fans of these two vehicles, right? It, it means that they, they actually want to have their own story. They want to have an exclusive story. They want to be the only one that got you on the phone. So they, they don't want to be treated like cattle, like get in this room or get on this call. You're all going to hear the same thing. That is not what most, you know, reporters or certainly investigative reporters are going to want to do. Um, but I just wanted to go over them briefly. Another tool in your toolbox. So, you know, in that press release, it's only one page. You, there's only so much you can get in there um, information wise. Think about other tools like backgrounders, fact sheets, um, studies, infographics that can help the reporter flesh out the story and understand the context more around that issue. Um, again, keeping them, you know, most reporters are not going to take time to go through a 30 page report. So just what can you do to condense and pick out the most important uh, data points, um, perspectives for them to include in their story. Let's switch over and talk about uh, opinion. So this is not news, but it's opinion um, traditionally in, in print media. Uh, another great way to go, especially if you're not getting a lot of pickup when you call a mainstream news reporter, um, it's kind of almost a run around them. Go, you know, if you didn't get them to do the story, can you use a letter to the editor? Um, can you get an op-ed or a guest column published, which again is, is an awesome way to go because it's all your words. It's not, you know, one quote in a, you know, thousand word article. It's 800 of your own words. Um, or in the case of a letter to the editor, 200 words. Um, Op-ed stands for opposite the, opinion, opposite the editorial page. So if you can picture a newspaper, uh, you open it up and on the left side often is the editorials. Editorials are unsigned. They're done by a, a, a committee at the paper, usually a committee of editors and reporters, maybe even some people from the community um, kind of put, putting their opinion on, on the issue out there. And then on the other page, you would have guest columns that might be weighing in on different news stories or issues in the news um, with strong opinions one way or the other. So these are three examples here up top is a letter to the editor. Down here to the right is, a, is an op-ed, a, a guest column by a doctor um, on what's going on in nursing homes. And to the left here is an editorial in the Chicago Tribune. Should I pause here? Does, does anyone have any questions so far? No? Okay, I'll keep, keep going. Um, after a story is published or airs, that's not the end of the road for it, right? You've got to keep, keep these clips on file if you can. Um, the your news stories that include you can be really powerful testament to your program's ability to engage the public, reach the public, and achieve impact include them on grant proposals, on reports to funders and their volunteers. You can also multiply the audience. So a new, one news article might have reached, you know, whatever the readership is that day. But if you roll it up into your website, circulate it to your staff, your volunteers, your families, your newsletter audience, and through your social media channels, um, it's going to impact even more people. All right, there, I will uh, stop and pause and we can open it up for questions. And I stop sharing my screen. Okay, I'm back. Do you guys have any questions about those tools and tactics? Does it feel overwhelming? Like, does it? Do you have a media list? Have you used it? What are some of the issues you run into when you are proactively trying to get a reporter to, to include your voice or your issue? This is Amanda from Idaho. I think the thing that is maybe intimidating for me is knowing where to start. What's the best, um, what is the best manner in getting your feet wet without um, getting up to your neck? Right. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I 
start with a letter to the editor. Honestly, that's kind of the, it's a bite-sized way to go. It's all again in your own words. Um, you know, did you see a story that was relevant to what you're working on? Is that an opening for you to say, hey, dear editor, I saw this, you know, and here's another perspective that they didn't include in that, or here's what's missing, or that was misinformed. You know, anything you can do to ping off of the coverage that they've been already uh, uh, doing. So I, I recommend starting with a letter to the editor. It's, um, it's a great dip your toe in. Um, and then, you know, you're right, it can be overwhelming, which, so say you have a media list of, I don't know, in Seattle alone, you know, we've got probably several dozen um, media outlets or reporters. Where would I start? For re something really important and big and, and needs to be, you really want to get this carried statewide, I would really focus on the, the wire, the Associated Press. It's an extremely important outlet. It's going to be carried, have a good chance of being carried across the state um, in multiple papers. Um, second to that would be your major, you know, your major outlet, you know, whether it's the daily newspaper that's biggest in your state, um, the three, maybe four network TV affiliates, great way to get the most bang for your buck. Um, does that help answer your question? That was excellent, thank you. Okay, good. Any I also other? wanted to say um, what Carol put in the chat, so if you're not on your computer, you may not oh. see it, but she said um, pulling together a media list is a good task for a volunteer ombudsman to work on. Definitely. Yeah, you know, that says, that could be several days worth of work just to call around and, it, you know, say we're putting together a media list for the om ombudsman program. Um, who are the reporters that cover uh, you know, in general, I mean, long-term care is great, but health, um, you know, now there probably is a COVID beat, <laughs> everyone's on it, but yeah, putting together that list of who to call when um, you need to reach them is a great idea. Hi, Kristen, it's Patty. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that Responding to a call from a reporter feels pretty comfortable these days, but initiate, initiating one is just harder for me. And one thing that comes to mind is when there's something I do want to be able to get in the, the press, it can be hard for me. It seems like I'm walking myself into a controversy and in two places, like if it's something legislative, then how do I do that without pissing off the author of that legislation to a degree that they could be very um, difficult to, to approach and work with, for example. And so that, that seems to hold me back because I'm not quite sure how to pitch a story without basically, you know, casting villains and right. angels or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you could walk in and say, hey, I just want to make sure that you know I'm around. I can be a resource if you have questions regarding these issues. There's bills, there's, you know, policies or proclamations by the governor. We are a resource if you would like to get our perspective as a third party um, objective voice uh, on this population. Offer yourself up as that resource and, mm -hmm. and hopefully the reporter will take you up on it. Um, and then I think last week we talked about a little bit of tools where you can go off the record. You could go on background um, where you can share some information but not get it attributed back to you if you don't want to see your name as some kind of, um, in some kind of conflict with, say, a, a legislator. Um, it is intimidating. It can be awkward. And, you know, if there's someone on your staff who can make those calls for you and say, hey, you know, I know you're covering this. Um, you know, Patty is our state's ombudsman. Uh, she would be a great person to talk to about X, Y, and Z and have somebody else kind of set it up for you. That can help. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just funny that for some reason, I mean, I don't particularly mind saying things that I think are somewhat controversial if I think they're the right thing, but somehow initiating it with a reporter has felt has obviously been something I've avoided. 
Yeah, no, I can understand why. And it, you know, you guys are in a really delicate position. Um, so. Well, what you've said is helpful. I, yeah, you know, and that's where it's just a confession. something written up too might take the pressure off of you feeling like, I'm calling to get in somebody's face, you know, writing up kind of a, that backgrounder or, Hey, these are the things you really need to keep in mind. Did you know, you know, these are resident rights and just putting it in writing and sending it to them kind of takes it out of the personal attack. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So Kirsten, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, this is um, Joni Latimer in Virginia. So it, first of all, I just think, your, these segments are very, very valuable. I haven't gotten to do them all, but I will go back and listen. So, um, but I do have a question and I apologize if you may have covered it um, on another segment. So we have had quite a few contacts and we've been responding and trying to keep good faith with the reporters and help them get what they need. And we've certainly been saying some things that haven't always been so popular. Um, <laughs> which is okay, as, as Patty's saying, that's part of the deal. Um, I'm a little curious about the dynamics from um, the media's perspective, from our reporter's perspective, and whether there's any availability of um, being able to go back to a reporter that has been picking up some things and um, doing decent reporting, et cetera, but you kind of want to have a conversation about how, well, exactly that issue of our program's um, fine balance and what we would suggest as um, maybe a deeper way of going at a story. I mean, that's part of the frustration sometimes is they're picking up on the what sells and the hot item, hot issue and the, and the surface level. And, and I don't mean to be demeaning reporters right. anyway, but. Exactly. Yeah, the yeah. sensationalist stuff. And, you know, I think one of those, and we, yes, I think Katie's been um, posting some of my slides from before, but there's, you know, for instance, you could say, you know, there's one question that nobody's been asking, or there's a really important fundamental question here that needs look, that needs to be, better explained to the public or that policymakers need to be aware of. I think pointing out to reporters there's something that hasn't gotten the coverage that it it needs to for everyone yeah. to have understanding. Reporters love that. Oh, there's something nobody's covered yet or there's, you know, this question hasn't been asked yet. Great. Again, give them something that that differentiates themselves from the the crowd. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That's an idea. Great. Thank you. You could call and say, hey, I've been following your coverage. This is great. Um, you know, here's something that hasn't received the attention that I think it, it deserves. Yeah, that's that's a great framing. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else before we go? And any other requests to make sure, I think next week is the last one we have scheduled to make sure that I cover so, anything that I've missed, um, anything you want more practice with. Let me know or just send me an email. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. You guys hang in and keep up the good work. Take care of yourselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.